We're back again. Oh, my hands are in front of your face. We're back <laughs> again. Again. <laughs> We're doing it again. Emergency Bible study episode five. We have John Mate here who was here on the first What's episode. Up? And we got doozy talk Susanna Young here. And we're about to get into the word of God. We're going to get into some mind bending thoughts. And we're going to talk about things that are challenging for believers. Things that I like to ask a lot of questions. I like to ask, especially Christians. If people, if you claim to believe in God, I like to ask you questions to make you think about your faith in God. And some of the questions I've been asking lately is how do you know you know God? Now, there's a, about a lot of responses to that question in the comments on my shorts videos. And it's like a, people have a love-hate relationship just with the question alone. How, how do you know you know God? Some people are like, well, that's simple because the Bible says something or if you pray, you'll experience the presence of God or th there's so many answers that people have on how do you know that you know God? And it's a... It's something that I ask the question, not because I'm looking for a right or wrong answer. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I ask the question because I want people to actually think about their faith and what they've chose to believe. And regardless if they believe in God or not, the question similar, it can be a similar in a different context where I can just say in general, how do you know what you believe is true? I asked that question. How do you know what you believe is true, whether you believe in God or not? And a lot of people are like, well, I studied this and I, I read a ton of books and I have all this evidence. This is how I know. And again, not a right or wrong answer. It's just something to make the person think for themselves. And one thing that causes me to realize if people actually believe what they believe or if they believe what they believe is true or not, is how they respond to the question, such as if there's like an overreaction, like there's instantly a discomfort to the question. It says a lot about the person. And I, and I bring this up because when we talk about topics, I want you to think about the questions for yourself. So if I ask John something or if I ask Susanna something and you see them thinking about it, and in your mind, you might think, well, that's an easy answer, whatever I ask them. It's not an easy answer for everyone. And the other thing is this is it's as if a lot of people are on autopilot. You have preconceived ideas. You have if someone were to ask you, why do you believe in Jesus? You might just quote the Bible. Well, the Bible says Jesus is real. And I'm asking you to think about that. Do you actually believe in Christ or do you just believe it just because? because you were raised in it or you grew up in church. So yeah, challenging questions, not to try to make someone lose faith in God. Cause I see a lot of, some people get discomfort, uncomfortable when I ask these questions and some people will be like, uh, I've had, I've even had people say, when you ask certain questions, you might lead people away from God just by asking the question. And what I'm saying is, look, if that's true, that says something about your faith. That says something about you as an individual. That is how you actually think. So anyways, I just wanted to lay that out real quick. Right, that was good. That was a good intro. It's good. And um, anyways, what's up with you guys? I want to ask you guys. Honestly, I, I don't I don't want to talk about fluffy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to just talk about how's your day? How's your week? Bro, I want to go straight into something deep. Right. I'm going to start off by asking John something. He has no clue what I'm going to ask. Are you able him. to, uh, can you hear me, by the way? I can hear you. Okay, it's good. I, I can hear myself. So I just want to double check. You can just get closer to the mic. Test, 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 test. Yeah, that's the best thing you can do right there. Okay. Get close to I it. can't hear myself, but it's fine. I'm sure you guys, the audience can hear me. You can't hear yourself? No. But yeah, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm anticipating the question he has for me. I'm curious what it is. Oh, there you go. I can hear him. Yeah, so I'm curious what question he has for me. I want to ask John a question, and I might ask you this too. I don't know how I'm going to word this, but this in, in real time, you're seeing me come up with a question, and I know I kind of know what I want to ask, but how do I word this? John, you've been going to church since you were a child, right? Yes, with my, with my parents. 
Great. You were raised in church? Uh, yeah. When did you always believe in God or did you, when did you start believing in God? Well, I mean, I, I knew about God because I was born uh, in, you know, in a, in a house of faith, but it wasn't until I was about 11 or 12 when I decided to get baptized because, you know, I was independent with my relationship with Christ. And then that was when I, you know, after uh, baptism, that's when I was like, exercise, exercising my faith and I wanted mm. to read the Bible and actually like obey God and spend personal time with him. Nice. And then that was a journey since then. So now. So when you were 12 years old, when you decided I'm going to believe in God or you got baptized. Yeah. So I got baptized because I wanted to like actually make a choice and have a, a personal relationship with uh, Jesus. I see. Did, who influenced you to make that decision? Um, I think it was just God working in my life uh, personally, because, uh, you know, just even a kid in, in elementary school in California where I was uh, born and raised in California, um, you know, I've seen I've seen like uh, God kind of move my life. And I was like, I, you know, I actually healed someone in, in the uh, recess time in school <laughs> as a kid. Are you praying for someone to be yeah, healed? Yeah, I prayed for someone. Uh, and so so I healed their back. And then and then the guy's like, oh, that wasn't God. And I was like, yeah, that was God. <laughs> and then uh, well, a person got healed and they said that that wasn't God. Yeah, it wasn't God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, you know, just seeing that, I was like, wow, like, what if I have like gift of healing or something? But like, you know, I kind of felt like the, the, the like uh, some some like uh, presence or whatever. But I was like, is this God or not? But wow, you know, I, I, I you know, I still didn't know, uh, 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 you know, God that much. But I was like, wait, yeah. this is kind of like this is kind of cool. What's going on? And then, you know, of course, like, you know, I've I've, uh, you know, like my love language is quality time. So I'm, I'm you know, more of an introvert. And yeah. uh, I, I love quality time. So just being alone all the time, like I, I can kind of like, you know, just like think I think a lot and I'm like, well, you know, what if God is real? What if this or this or this? And then you know, I, I can actually have like the thought that like God putting thoughts in my in my mind, telling me that he loves me and stuff like that. And I, you know, I'll come to my, my mom and she'll pray for me and stuff like that. And I'll be like, hey, mom, like, how come I have these thoughts and everything? And then she'll mm. be like, oh, it's because of God. But so, you know, it's more like my parents kind of uh, guiding me towards that yeah. truth that I was like experiencing. And then, uh, so yeah, and then ever wow. since then, after that, I was like more independent, got baptized and stuff, so. Nice, nice. So my question, here we go. Has there ever been a time in your life where you genuinely started to doubt your faith? Um, let me see. I, th um, I can't think of, uh, of a point in time no, I mean, probably not, not really, because like, you know, like uh, I I realized that like, you know, God's going to take us to, uh, to like a uh, like a desert, like a wilderness, yeah. especially post baptism, especially after something big that happens in your life, there's going to be some sort of like tribulation or something. So I, I realized that God like is going to be there for me, but, but I never really kind of doubted, you know, yeah. I, like, you know, I, I you know, I, 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 I had thoughts of it now and then like, what if this is fake? Like, what if, what if, you know, what if I was born in, uh, in, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in, in in Iraq, and then I preach a like a you know, um, you know Islam or something like that. You know? Yeah. Or or like, what if I was born in 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 like another country, and then I preach another God because I was born there, you know? So you know what I mean? But like people who are born in America and other parts of the world, they you know they 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 preach God depending on where they're born, how they're raised. Right. You know. But like I, um, so you know I did have those thoughts of okay, like what if I was born in Iraq and I was you know believing in another God just because I was born there? You know what I mean? So I was like, yeah. Like, 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 you kind of were questioning. Maybe you just believe in God because you were raised here. Yeah, exactly. So, I see. yeah, so, you know, that was a big one. So, uh, you know, I think that kind of a uh, thought process that I was thinking was like, was the point that you're uh, trying to get the answer for. How old were you? Um, well, I mean, I was like, uh, like, you know, in, in, in my early 20s, honestly. So, like, you know, I was like uh, premature. I was going to Bible college, you know, stuff like that. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so I was like thinking about that. I was like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm doing homework. I'm reading the Bible. I'm going to school for all this. And I was like writing, like taking notes. I, I kind of stopped. And I kind of stopped. And I was like, wait, you know, you know, how come I'm doing this? You know, <laughs> and I was like, and I was like, wait, like, you know, what if I was born in Iraq or something wow. like that? Or, or born in Russia and I was believing some other idol or something like, you know? Yeah. But so like, you know, that's the biggest question to, for, for people to, to know. Like, you know, what if I was born in Japan or something like that or some other country? And I was like, you know, telling Christians that they're wrong, you know, who knows? Right. So... <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah. so that was like the biggest dot, doubt that I've had for a while. But then I realized, you know, that that like, you know, it's, you know, you know, um, um, so, you know, according to my my, my relationship with God, um, like, you know, there is authority of, of scripture, you know, um, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, and also, for example, also, uh, you know, um, um, you know, um, you know, Islam, like, 
Muhammad, the reason why he he created the the religion of Islam Islam is because Christians uh, mistreated um, Muhammad. Really? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I mean, that's what Billy Graham said. But like, uh, so you know, if Christians did wow. not, so you know, if if Christians did not like um, uh, mistreat him, just like how Christians mistreated Kanye West and everything like that, like you know, like, then then like they wouldn't, uh, they, they he wouldn't create that religion. You know. Wow. Yeah. So I'm just kind of saying like, you know, so, you know, just having that mindset too, I was like, wait a minute. So then, and then, and then I continued writing. I was like, okay, um, um, I believe the right God, you know, <laughs> in school or something like that. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Wow. That is amazing. Uh -huh. Well, dang, that's okay. So one of the things that you were kind of doubting was the fact that you were raised in America, raised in a Christian home. Maybe that's why you believe in Jesus. Yeah. Like, you know, had I been born in, in, in a different country with a different, like a, like a house of, of religion, like you know, right. what I mean? that's like what 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 really like challenged my faith. I was like, like wow. Right. But then, like, yeah. So, great. Well, that, hey, that that answers my question, Susie. I have the same question for you. I mean, you grew up as a pastor's kid. Mm -hmm. Was there any point in your life where you genuinely started to doubt Yeshua? Not, not God. It wasn't God that I doubted. And I always believed in God because, I mean, I was raised in the preacher's home. That's what you hear. You go to church three, four, five times a week or more, depending on what events are happening that week. So to me, I never thought about doubting God. I'll sometimes, like, when I have, like, a deep thought, like, well, how do we prove God exists? I'd be like, well, that's an interesting concept, but it doesn't make me think God doesn't exist. Yeah. So that's never really been an issue for me. But doubting what I believe about God, that I've done. And that mm. was probably um, my late teen, well, almost my whole life, honestly, that I would, I'd be like, well, I believe this about God because I've read this in the Bible, but is that really the truth? Or the pastor said this in church and it's contrary to what I believe. What does the Bible say? And so I'll like, I'll doubt what I believe about God, but doubting that God exists, doubting that Jesus Christ exists, that's never been, that's never been something I've dealt with. Okay, great. Well, I'd say I was probably slightly different answer than both of you guys because I didn't really grow up in a churchy home. I went to church growing up, but wasn't really we weren't really churchy people. <laughs> it was just kind of go to church for fun type of thing. So I would say for me as a young man, I remember the day where I thought I remember I was in my living room and I was thinking, do I believe in God? I remember that. I was like, do I believe in do I even believe in this stuff? And then even as a young kid, I was like, you know what? I do I think I do believe in God, but I just remember going a long period of time when I was a kid. Cause I remember the first time I heard about David and Goliath at some random church when I was a kid. And I was like, What? <laughs> and then one of my childhood friends told me about Noah's Ark. And he was telling me how the world was created and what had happened in the beginning of time. And this guy, he, he was an atheist, but he had read the Bible. And so I remember that was the first time I ever heard about biblical stories. And so I just thought, okay, well, maybe it's true, I guess. Right. Yeah. Okay. I didn't like believe it or not believe it. It's kind of like, it was just information for me, but it wasn't until I started to really dig and seek for myself that I started to realize, okay, no, I, I do have faith. I believe in God, but there was, there were times in my life where I genuinely did start to, I'm not sure if I doubted God's existence. I've thought about those things. Like I, I do I actually think that God exists, but I think there's like this default setting in my brain that doesn't allow me to, even consider that idea. Mm. <laughs> right. And one of the reasons I would say is because for me, it's too risky to just 
default to there is no God. Because if I die and then I end up meeting him <laughs> and I was wrong, I, I'd, I'd rather just if there is no God, let's say let's say let's say that I didn't believe in God at all. I don't even believe in God. This is what I would do if I was an atheist. <laughs> I'd probably still read the Bible. I'd probably still go to church. I'd still do the motions, probably. Even if you were an atheist, you're going and doing things you don't believe and you don't agree with? If it was me, I can't speak for other atheists, but as for me, because for me, I, I, I like, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in survival mode. So I'm like, okay, well, if there is an eternity after I die, I think the best way to survive in eternity is to believe that there is a God. <laughs> so, so... <laughs> Like, even if I have to, like, do the motions, because I'm like, ah. So, like, is it easier to be to be an atheist then than to believe in God and know that everything was created from God? Is it easier to be an atheist? Oh, shoot. Because, like, the thing is, like, you know, it takes more faith to be an atheist, just like from that one guy. Remember that? <laughs> Der is it Derek? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> Frank Turek. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Frank Turek. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Okay. I mean, I might be a little bit extreme what I said, like go to church and do all that stuff. But I would say that I, I, I still would have some sort of a ritual type thing. Okay, that makes. You sense. see what I'm saying? Because like I think it's just too risky. Like I'm, I am obsessive. I'm obsessed with the. I was literally thinking about this, actually, probably today. Well, I've been thinking about this for a while. I'm like, what, what matters to me most? What have I been thinking about? I'm about to ask you guys this in a second. I. I I was thinking to myself, what do I think about the most? God. It's like this thing has been on my mind since I was a kid. It's it's always on my mind all the time. I'm obsessed with this idea of God. And then so I couldn't imagine like if I was if I was someone who didn't believe in God, I think that I would be obsessed with the idea of what's going to happen after I die. Mm -hmm. Like what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Like I need to know. I'd probably end up like a mad scientist or something. Someone I would study history. I would study science. I'd try to figure out how the world began. I, I think I would be like a, an Einstein or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm just obsessed with it. So anyways, do you, what do you, what do you guys think <clears throat> about the most in your life? No, so I mean, like, you know, I wake up in the morning, I spend time with uh, God, read the Bible and everything. So I kind of meditate some scriptures and everything. And then I use that scripture like, you know, throughout my day. So so that's how I meditate in uh, my like my scripture. Um, so I can like really process that one scripture every day. So that's how I meditate. Mm, nice. And then uh, so, yeah, like, you know, I have that as a priority. And then, you know, number two is like business. So like, you know, you know, I've been really business savvy over the last few years. And so I've been really uh, like, you know, um, Same. focusing on that, too. And then, of course, like other stuff like that, like family, hanging out, like friends or right you know in, in the end like after everything's over but right yeah. <laughs> after everything's over like right. end of the end yeah, of, like the, of time the, of of the day pretty much oh end of the day i was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay Susie? so i feel like a copycat saying that what's on my mind most is god but that's kind of what if it is you, in a long it, in an interesting way because i'm obsessed with understanding the point to life like, why am I actually here? What? Because I've had, when I was young, when I was eight years old, I was in a car accident that could have, um, it could have, what do we call it, deleted me? Because I can't use the actual word. Um, and then if that wasn't going to be the case and the doctors were concerned that I was going to have permanent brain injury and then that ended up not being an issue. Then there was permanent uh, visual injury, and that wasn't an issue. Um, I ended up with a full recovery. And I'm like, well, why did God keep me alive then? And then there's been other situations where I'm like, I don't, th like, yes, we can say, well, it's just, it, it, that's just what happened. Like, you just happen to survive it, like it's luck. But, I'm like, some of this stuff, especially that situation early in my life, that was, um, th that was just, um, something that always made me wonder, like, 
why did God get me through that? And coming out of that situation as well as what I did. So that's kind of my obsession is trying to understand that aspect of God. And of course, even with business, but it goes back to the same thing of understanding my purpose, like why I'm here. Well, so you are, you want to understand your purpose? Yes. Gotcha. Great. I want to read something that John said in the comment section. <laughs> but actually, I liked his I liked his response to how do you know you know God? John said That's funny because like you know, I was at the, I was at the FedEx truck delivering, I kinda of stopped him when I when I wrote that. <laughs> oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. John says, I would say I know God because I spend quality secret time with God in my room. Only way to know someone is when you spent time with that person. Now to know God is to obey God. Do we know him? Do we know of him or do we know him? Do we know him enough to obey him? The gospel of John says, he would put the gospel of John, <laughs> <laughs> says when we obey and love God, he will make himself known to us in a personal way. There's a lot of responses to that. Let me, I'm going to read someone else's response. How do you know you know God? So the other guy says, you believe God exists and follow his commandments and accept that Jesus is Lord and Savior. When you're in a relationship, you study, search, and seek. Okay, someone else says, you know God when, when God knows you. Someone else says, the better question is, does Jesus know you? I think I responded to this one. I said, Why? it's good. Um, you said uh, that was like, you know, energy. Like that was good energy, right? Oh, someone else. I, that was a previous one. I said to this person, it's a great question. Would you like to answer mine first? Let's dialogue. This person responded, yes, sir. Absolutely. I'm humble enough to take in another's perspective. Only a fool would believe that a complete stranger would have nothing to teach you. I do have to give credit where credit is due, though. You did ask an excellent question, but it answers but to answer yours, I believe it's faith along with understanding of the word. All too often people create the, Im the image of what they believe God is instead of taking his word and actually reading it and accepting it for what it is. People make God fit them instead of making themselves fit God. Okay. How do you know you know God? Let me see. Someone else said, um, I can feel him. I can see him. He's in the beauty that lays in love. He's the beauty of mother nature. You, you close your eyes and you feel the wind on your face. How do you know you're feeling the wind on your face? I just do. I feel it. I know it. Okay. Oh yeah. Also I was going to add to that too. So pretty much, you know, so, so the question that you asked actually stirs up the mind because it's really complicated, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so really, you know, with that kind of question, um, you know, the mind can really take over. So, um, but you know, you'd have to shut off your mind and then just allow your heart uh, to answer that question really, because like, honestly, you know, that's where the heart, uh, you know, that's where the true answer will come from because that's where, that's where God dwells, you know? Yeah. So if, if, if so if people try to use their mind, like, wait, that's too complicated. And you know, but, but really, you know, like, um, you, you have to answer with your heart. That's where, that, that's what, where the relationship with God uh, come, comes in from. Yeah. So mm -hmm. like you have to turn off your mind and really just like, uh, you know, answer that question with your heart for those people who are watching. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, one thing that comes to my mind is if I say, how do you know, you know, God, it, it, it it's a question that tackles what you believe in. And if you actually believe it to be true or not, and when people have an emotional reaction to that question, it just says a lot about how you think of it. And I like what John just said, where people use their mind to try to answer that question. We're not, not, not use their heart or like come from a genuine place of answering that question. Even saying, honestly, I don't know. That's a, that's a genuine answer. Yeah. Not just trying to sound smart and say, well, the Bible says, Blah blah blah. Yeah. That's how I know. No, no, well, about. like you know, but like the thing is, you know, once you go straight to the Bible, then then that's when like the relationship is cut off. Like that, that's not that's not real stuff. You like you you know, so it has to come from your own personal experience. That's what it's all about. That that's yeah. why you're answering it. Yeah, and because it just makes me think where, and and I'm asking this 
like I say, this Bible study, emergency Bible study, I want people to think practically, be real, be realistic. And I'm a bit of a realist myself where I am admitting I'm just going by faith. Okay, yes, I've had encounters. I've had experiences that I would describe as supernatural and spiritual. But he's still, even at the end of the day, the kind of guy I am, if I saw someone walking on water, there'd still be a part of me that's like, huh? Did that really just happen? Especially me, me being a magician. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, I am, my brain is wired to doubt things. Mm -hmm. And so I have to admit, okay, I'm just going by faith. And, If, if we think about this practically, how do you know you know God? If I say to someone, do you know John? And their instant response is, well, I see John's Facebook posts. Or I seen John on YouTube and he was promoting his book. Or I've heard of John. Great. Do you know him though? Well, how? Oh, that's a challenging question. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I I seen him on video. <laughs> I see him on your podcast. But like, if someone can be like, you know, if if someone can mention like an inside joke that only you will know from like from twelfth grade or sixth grade, you know, and mm -hmm. then and then and then I'll, and then I get it. I'm like, yeah, that's that's really you because that inside joke, and no one else knows. Yeah. Or, or like a secret, you know, inside joke. Yeah. Right. Like like that. Then 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 you know him. So yeah, now nah, yeah yeah, you because you had some secret relationship well not secret relationship yeah kind of secret. yeah like private a, yeah yeah like a joke in private a conversations but people will also be like well i i read a book that somebody wrote and they referenced john and so that's how i know that i know john <laughs> right <laughs> yeah but no yeah because they know of him you know? right they know of him but they don't actually know yeah him and they're trying to use that as a reasoning. Someone else said in response to how do you know you know God? They said, not a difficult question. Jesus is the answer you're looking for. He is literally the answer made flesh. Okay. I said, um, oh, I think I responded to this. I said, I agree that Jesus is the answer. I said, during Bible study, I'm challenging our own belief in God by asking, how do we know that we know God? At the end of Bible study, I answer this question on my own as well as my co-hosts. I say this respectfully. This question is a question we usually answer in a cliche kind of way where we often just quote a scripture or throw out an answer we have not actually put thought in. There is no right, no wrong or right answer during Bible study. Everyone's free to share their personal thoughts. Hopefully, at so, some point, some people come around. Cause I think people are looking. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who like it, right? But there's a lot of people who, when you start asking real questions, poof, it, it it hits something. It hits yeah. a nerve. Someone else said, "How do you know you know God? You could do this about any claim of knowledge. How do you know your mother? How do you know Bob?" <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> what because so and so is a physical being it is different no how do you know them you know god in your mind you know god in your heart you know god in your very being it may be a hard to answer question but so is any other knowledge claim you know god by having an encounter with god you have heard him through his word and testimony you have responded. You are filled with his spirit. The word of truth lives in you. Or do you or you do not know God? You may know that there must be a God, but you do not know the living God who is truth incarnate. This is a nonsense question. It is ask it is like asking someone to prove their consciousness. It was it was just like how I mentioned, like, you know, uh, it's just like knowing another person. Remember that? And then also mm -hmm. how uh, how if you, if you come to Jesus and obey him, then then he will, you know, reveal himself in, a, in an intimate uh, level. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what he like, kind of rephrased. But, right. You know, so I responded. I said I was actually in agreement 
when reading this until I got to the part, this is a nonsense question. I say this respectfully. I think it is a very logical question to ask because a lot of people throw out the idea that they know God, the Mormons, the Catholics, the Protestant, the Pentecostals, everyone claims they know God and have the truth. I think it's a challenging question for sure. One that I think must be asked to anyone who claims they have the truth about God. Any thoughts? Let's a dialogue. He responded or he said, yes, all in respect. I mean, no disrespect by saying this is a nonsense question. There are different meanings to what is meant by knowledge. Number two, only when you are truly saved, do you realize that you know him? Why do they keep? Anyways, perhaps we could call this the the difference between personal relationship rather than knowledge of deity. Now, here is the inevitable problem inevitable problem to just asking how do you know you know God without clarifying your meaning. Ask any of those following other faiths and they will say they know him. Ask them how they will tell you something that is more convincing to you than your response will be to them. Even asking a Christian how they know God requires clarifying what you mean to avoid equivocation between knowledge of and saving faith. I'm too low IQ. Um, I don't know. I think uh, so. Uh, um, uh, uh, the people that comment, they have bad grammar. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and it takes harder to read because like, you know, because like, you know, you know, reading a book, it, they have editors. So yeah, you right. over here. It's just, there's no editor. So, so just type in. And even the true believer does not have complete knowledge of God. Yes, we have enough. First Corinthians 13, 12. We don't have complete knowledge, but will. To illustrate the problem, how do you know your mother or anything? Can you prove it? How do you answer the question, do you know God? If you give the answer that Christians will find acceptable, does that prove you know God? My point is that rather than questioning what must be, I don't even know how to say this word, axiomatic, axiomatic, we do better to just proclaim him and those that hear and are drawn to him through the message we proclaim will know him when they come to him. Okay. Well, here's my thing is if I can't necessarily prove that my mother exists like i can't i can't prove it right now if i'm sitting here with I, you guys i can call her it's right live. i can call her or whatever but i'm asking a logical question not a, this isn't a i'm looking for an i got gotcha you moment i outsmarted you this isn't uh i'm trying to get you to prove that you know god it's not that i'm asking you for yourself you know your mother's exists you know your father exists and, and, and it doesn't take, look, I respect the response. I respect the response, but it starts to get into wall well, pettiness a little bit where it's like, well, how, how do you know the earth was created? How do you know, how do you know you exist? How do you know, mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? And, and we start to get out of illogic. It's no longer a practice. It's not, not a real conversation anymore. It's, it's not practical. So. There's no wrong or right answer. The question is for you. And so again, if you're seeing this video, I am asking you as an individual, how do you know you know God? You don't have to prove it to me. The question's for you to think for yourself. And if the question makes you uncomfortable, it might say something about how you believe in God. Right. And and that that's the part that I'm trying to get at. Where 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 is your heart at with this? Um yeah. so right, I think the Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So it's mainly for like, you know, so it's like self edification kind of thing. So, right. So, so they can really question and like uh you know put you know just kind of like put them uh like their their, their faith to the test kind of thing. Yeah. Like honestly, like you know honestly, no one can really prove if if like if you really know God or not. Like even so you know even with the uh you know how 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 a man can know someone else by their fruits. Like even with the fruits you can't know. Cause, yeah, cause that's Because people are good actors. They can really <laughs> put out some good uh, fruits and then they can really you know live up and do some 
True. Mm-hmm. Wild parties and stuff. Like that. that is very true, bro. <laughs> very true. That is very true. Yeah, yeah. So like really like, you know, this is just for them to self edify and really like kind of like, you know, uh, kind of challenge their faith and uh, to really like, uh, you know, fix their, you know, kind of like whatever they need to fix. Right. And then uh, really just like uh, pursue their, uh, their relationship with Jesus. But really it's just for them. For real. Not for like, oh, I, I, can, I can prove this and this. I mean, if you can, like as far as like, you know, what I can do is like, I can just say like, well, you know, so it's, it's it's just like knowing another person kind of thing, right? Bro, if you could prove God, I want to know. Because <laughs> I'll be the first person in line. Look, I'm look, like, wait, look, you proved it? Well, well, honestly, like, you know, you cannot prove that God is real because, you know, you need faith to prove it for yourself, not for anyone else. Right, exactly. Right. You know? So, yeah, it's impossible to prove that God is real nor fake. So that's just how it is. That's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we really are going by faith. And yeah. what's interesting is that in my in one of the videos I uploaded on my channel, there were people who were like, oh, God proves it over and over and over again. And I'm like, well, well, it well, is in the Bible. Yeah, I know. But, but, but you know, uh, so so the reason why it is proven to other people is because they have that faith to prove it. Like, exactly. And again, it goes back to faith. Like no one else can prove that God exists only because like, you know, so so in the book of John, no, sorry. Uh, so so in the Gospels, it says that, you know, um, you know, only by faith you can please God. That's mm-hmm. it. Only by faith. So it's the same thing, you know, if, yeah. if, 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 if you want to please God for yourself, it's for your personal relationship with God. That's how you please him. And then it's not for anyone else, but for you, because like it's 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 your oil in the candle, not not yeah. anyone else's, just like how it says mm-hmm. in the parable. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> bro. Like, I mean, that's facts, man. Like, even if Jesus Christ himself walked up to you and slapped you in the face, you couldn't prove it. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, only you know it like wow yeah. i had a personal slap with jesus just think about it like you know how moses uh, crossed the, the the red sea mm-hmm. and all that and then like you know you know they actually saw the red sea split open and, and like you know it was, it was it was a miraculous thing right they saw yeah. the physical eyes and then after that they went to the desert and then they doubted god right so, so really <laughs> right it's like, yeah so really like you know it's like you know you can still have a personal relationship with god and like still doubt so really it's like a self edification so that's good that you're doing to remind people right mm-hmm. and uh, it, uh, let's say moses met some outsiders right yeah he like met some outsiders and then they're like so you guys escaped from egypt like you got out of there how'd that happen and then moses is like okay well i took my staff and i raised my staff and i slammed on the ground and then the ocean rose up and then like we walked through and like god just whoever's listening to that story will be like oh wow okay. <laughs> yeah exactly this guy's kind of a nutcase so yeah <laughs> okay so anyways that I love those questions. How do you know you know God? Got a like lot that. of questions mm-hmm. like that. How do you know what you believe is true? Uh, it, it's all good stuff. Yeah. I wanted to show John something that I showed Anthony and I showed Susanna. Because you know how I'm always talking about kingdom and stuff. Yeah. So, so like people, I, I want to show people like God has an actual kingdom, bro. It's a, it's a real kingdom. It's a real government. Jesus is the king. He rules. And but I've been doing a study. I'm, I've been trying to study some of the Greek terminology in the Bible mm-hmm. and then see the 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 definition of it. And then I want to see the, the usage of it before Christ. So okay. like if we see a word, the word kingdom before Christ came, what was the usage of the word kingdom or how do you say it? Basilia in Greek, right? Well, this is this is something I just I recently looked up and I'm trying I've just started doing this. So if someone wants to ask me a lot of questions on what I'm studying on this, I'm not going to be able to answer because I just started doing this study. It's going to be a long study. But I wanted to know the origins of the word apostle. OK, right, because I obviously us being people who believe in God, we think the word apostle came from the bible or like that's that's the origin of that word but like like paul and everyone you know right Mm -hmm. (laughs) so i want to read this to john i just i just want to see how john responds so oh how it says and he gave him gave some to be apostles okay so this is an article that i found today i want to cover some of the historical usage usages of the word apostle you will see that it had many uses in the greek language of early new testament times and you'll also see how all of these uses have application to a new testament apostle apostle 
I believe this discussion will not only enrich your understanding of this ministry gift, but it will also help you more fully receive from this gift that among other purposes is given to help establish and strengthen you in the faith. And if you've ever sat under a true apostolic ministry now, I don't know if there's modern day apostles. I have no clue. <laughs> But I like this study that they did because they actually did some research on the word apostle. So actually, I'm going to go down. I'm going to just start going to the word. All right. Now, let me say this before. I'm studying this because I think that as Americans, we have a big misunderstanding of the Bible when it comes to the terminology when he uses kingdom terminology, like such as the word minister, there is a, there is a meaning to the word minister. Like for us, when we think of a minister, we think of a pastor or maybe like an usher in the church and they pass around the basket right, yeah. and different things. There's there that, that, that's all, that could all be a minister, but there's even a deeper meaning to that word as well. But I want to go into apostle apostle. All right. So apostle, in the Greek, it's apostolos. The admiral of a fleet of ships. During the time of the ancient Greek orator, I don't even know how to pronounce this name, Domos Thenes, 384, between 384 and 322 BC before Christ. The word apostolos was a naval term that described an admiral, the fleet of ships that traveled with him, and the specialized crew who accompanied and assisted the admiral. The fleet would be sent out to sea on a mission to locate territories where civilization was non-existent. Once an uncivilized region was identified, the admiral, called the apostolos, apostle, along with his specialized crew and all their cargo and belongings would disembark, settle down and work as a team to establish a new community. Then they would begin the process of transforming a strange land into a replica of life as they believed it should be. Their purpose was total colonization of the uncivilized territory within this specific, Within this special fleet of ships were both the personal, the personnel and the cargo required to establish a new culture, a new life and a new community. When that fleet pulled up to shore, it contained workers trained to build roads, construction, um, oh, construct buildings and teach uncivilized natives how to read, write and function in a new kind of social order. The, thus, the admiral, the apostle, became the team leader for the construction of a new society. Once the job was completed, a majority of the team members got back on the ships and launched out to sea again to find another uncivilized area and repeat the entire colonization process all over again. Thus, we find the word apostolos described an admiral or team leader who led a team to establish new communities in uncivilized territories. Yeah. And, and then, you know, so so if you really read uh, the writings of Paul, I mean, that's what he really did. He was preaching to Ephesus. He was teaching uh, Timothy. He was he was teaching the, new, the, 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 the younger generation. And, you know, he, he was really teaching Timothy about like, you know, if, if you're young, don't worry, like, you know, just really uh, like, uh, you know, lead them by example and, and stuff like that. So we, that's exactly what uh, Paul did. And that, and that's really interesting. It's a team leader for, for a new society. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's exactly what Paul did, really. Right. And, and it's funny because, like, it makes me think, and I'll, I'll read the rest soon, but it makes me think when Christ appointed them to be apostles and uh, there's this passage in the book of Acts where – it talks about Paul rented out, he rented out a home 
I mean, I don't know, you remember that? He rented out a home. I think, I, yeah, I think I remember that. And yeah. he had people come over to his place. Yeah. And every day they would talk, it said they would talk about um, the kingdom and the things concerning Jesus Christ. Mm. Or they talk about Jesus Christ and the things concerning the kingdom. Um, it's very, it's very interesting. And I think it's, can be kind of a touchy topic for a lot of people because have you ever heard people say that the spirit realm is more real than the physical yeah you ever heard yeah mm -hmm. it just makes me think when that word kingdom pops up throughout the bible repetitively there's so much in the old and new testament and christ I'm starting to realize how real this thing is. Like, I, I already believe in Jesus. I already believe in God, right? Right. But I'm realizing more and more how real this is. Where God doesn't want just a little bit. Oh, he doesn't. Oh. He wants he wants everything. He wants all well, of heaven, all of should, earth, all the people. Well, why should I, you know, so so you know, he doesn't just want everything. He wants the the, the first of everything and then the everything. Right. Yeah, <laughs> he wants the first of everything and then everything else yeah. afterwards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You 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 paid your little tithes, but the yeah. rest of that the other 90% but, still belongs there. But to it's him. not just the tithe. It's 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 your time, it's your energy, it's your group. Like, everything. So, so everything that you do like, you know, you bring it in the first, like especially in the morning. Right. Like, you know that's the first of everything right so it's, it's, it's not just money like you know tithe obviously has a, has a, has a, has this connotation of money yeah but really it's 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 your body too everything every everything. part of you so mm. really it's the first of everything then everything <laughs> <laughs> so default everything just, yeah. <laughs> and i like how this when he was reading off what the what that word means and how they would go to places and they would establish the culture yeah teaching people how to speak speak the language oh, dress the way we dress eat what we eat talk yeah. what we talk yeah and also the you know the the culture is actually a big thing it's not just like some other culture from another country so so culture is a mindset yeah you know, like you know again paul taught about the mind so many times that so so 80 percent of the the new the new testament writings of paul is about the mind so, right. so really like you know you know culture really is like for example if you look back if so if you look back at the tower of babel when when all the people spoke different languages and then they scattered to, to, to you know throughout the earth and they literally scattered right mm -hmm. like yeah so you know obviously you know so how come they didn't fall off a cliff well that's because like obviously that that disproves that earth is flat i'm just saying <laughs> no, anyway <laughs> so no but no but also the other thing the, the, the other thing is like uh so like pretty much you know like uh so like um uh what were they going <laughs> sorry <laughs> Oh, you were talking about culture. Yeah, that's right. So, so pretty much like like the the entire Bible, they split. The earth is round, everything, and then also like they they went to pretty much like another country, like they like China, Japan, and then now they all have their own mindset of what their the of of, of 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 what their culture is. So really, you know, culture just means your version of normal. So like, so really, like uh, Paul is actually bringing out to to uh, different communities what is normal in the kingdom of heaven, like mindset, mm -hmm. really, because like you know, it's your because like you know if it's normal to you, well. That's because your mind's used to it. That's why it's normal. So it's a mindset and bring that mindset into different communities. And then therefore, like he's he's establishing a new community because he's an apostle, what he's doing. Mm -hmm. When is John going to start preaching, bro? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, my boy Anthony, he's talking about starting a church. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. So he's a really good speaker. Power of God, you know, for sure. For real. But it's so deep because what John just said and what you were saying about Paul He's over here writing to all the different churches in Asia, and he'll write to the um, Philippians, the Ephesians, the Corinthians, the right. Romans, explaining to them exactly what they're supposed to be thinking, how they're supposed to be behaving. And he didn't just go there mm -hmm. and start churches, but he went there, started the churches, got the whole the, the whole thing set up, left and then wrote letters to make sure and had people going and making sure that these churches are following the uh, the set of rules or understanding the mindset of god yeah wow yeah it, it, you know something i understand and, and this is what i'm saying john i think I, I like to quote that scripture it's the goodness of god that leads men to repentance oh yes because yeah it's a um 
Romans 2. Romans, yeah. <laughs> because I like to quote that scripture because understanding what God is trying to do, understanding the mission of Jesus Christ, it helps me to realize, wait, he, he really does have my best interest in mind. He is not my enemy. For example, we, I think a lot of people, they're like, oh, I don't want nothing to do with God or I don't want nothing to do with Jesus because it, it, it controls everything about you. You have to live a certain way. You have to think a certain way. He, well, he doesn't even want you to think certain thoughts. Well, well, I mean, like, you know, there is a place prepared that has nothing to do with God. <laughs> yeah, hell, yeah, hell, that, that's, hell, yeah. All right. Well, it's, it's interesting because understanding that, like, when I'm, I'm studying kingdoms, right like literally like real kingdoms mm -hmm. and seeing the comparison from the bible on god's kingdom to the kingdoms of men and a lot of the systems run very similarly where and i like the scripture that anthony quoted that that we are a colony of heaven and kingdoms colonize and it's like and I, I like something Miles Monroe said that God was the God was the he's the founder. He he was the originator of the idea of a kingdom of a government. But the problem is, is like when you look in the Old Testament, mankind, they didn't want God to be the king of them. They wanted another man to come in between them as the king. And then that king can rule over them. They wanted a physical king. So it's like the kingdoms were in the same. It's just instead man's version of it doesn't work, but God's does. And But the thing is, is all kingdoms, whether it's God's kingdom or man's kingdom, they all function in the same in the sense that they want to control the way the people think. They want you to talk a certain way, speak a certain language. They want you to live. Everything is a reflection of the king and so when you have corrupt kingdoms where ideally you would you you would like your king to be a righteous king because if you're if you're if you don't have a righteous king then you're going to have a dictator someone who's going to rule over you and they only have their best interest in mind they'll allow the people to suffer they'll allow their own people to 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 suffer and in their suffering there's no help because the king's needs are met while everybody else is slaving away. And, but you look at God's kingdom, it's as if God's reputation is on the line. He needs his people to be taken care of, to be protected, to, because it, we're coming in the name of Jesus Christ and as representatives of him. And if people come and look at us and they're like, well, so you're telling me that if I come to Christ, I'm gonna end up homeless and broken, sad and depressed. Like, that's not a good reflection of the king. A righteous king in, in kingdoms, not just talking about the kingdom of God. Kings are concerned about the condition of their citizens. Because if their citizens are in good standing, if their citizens are taken care of, it makes them look good. It makes people want to come from other countries and travel to them and visit. Right. It boosts the economy. It makes people... It, it's like that's why so many people want to come to America, even though America is not a kingdom; it's a democracy. But so many people want to come here uh -huh. and travel here and go on vacation, and just they just they want to live in America. It, it makes the economy; it, it, it looks good. It makes it rich. Yeah, it's attractive. Mm -hmm. And like L.A., New York, Florida, you know? right? Yeah, Miami. Let's go yeah. to Miami. Like we was hang out. Miami Heat. You know? yeah. <laughs> My fans over there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, but I think oftentimes and. You know, like, I don't want to assume that you guys uh, think that everything that I'm thinking, this is just, this is, so obviously I don't want to speak for you guys. So you can, in a moment, I'll let you guys speak. But like, um, when I think about the kingdom of heaven, oftentimes I think, and I did this myself, we kind of over spiritualize it to where we don't see its application on earth we just think of it kind of like as this invisible thing that it's kind of imaginary but we don't think about it as a literal one and i and i like i bring this point up about the apostle because an apostle comes to expand and but this kingdom obviously is not a country on earth that you can find it's 
in a different dimension Mm -hmm. and it's colonizing on earth here so anyways i'm gonna read the rest of this but is there anything else you wanted to say before i move on i mean jesus said that like you know the kingdom of god the kingdom of god is not there or there it's actually in your heart so Mm -hmm. so you're not gonna be able to say look it's over there it's over there it's for it's within you even worship like you know like you know you shouldn't have to worship at the mountain anymore like uh, john four with the 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 well and the woman you know right Mm -hmm. so with the 600 wives i don't know how we want to say yeah so same thing like you know it's not in the mountain anymore it's it's like now like you know your altar is like mobile now because of the holy spirit Mm-hmm. I thought of the same the same thing whenever he was talking to. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Explain. What do you mean? Well, no, just the the whole the you the kingdom isn't over there. It's you can't say it's over here. It's it's inside of you. Yeah. It was in the Old Testament, I think, but no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because I like how Christ brings that up because in kingdoms, there's always a constitution where you can go somewhere. You can have a book and it opens up and you have the laws or it's a scroll and you have the laws listed. These are the rules. But in this kingdom, it's from within. The laws are written on the heart of a man. And so even if you don't read the Bible, there's a part of you that already knows right and wrong. Cause the, the, this, this kingdom is so advanced that it can't, other kingdoms cannot answer the problems that the kingdom of heaven can kingdoms of the earth. Let's take America, even though it's not a kingdom. They got all these rules, all these laws. You're trying to cause people to stop murdering people, stop selling drugs on the street. You're trying to control crime. But yeah, you can only write so many laws. You can only put so many people in prison. Yeah, of course. And like, you know, also like the, so, so in the Old Testament, like, you know, the the the, the laws were like 1600 laws. And mm-hmm. then after that, God actually uh, brought it down to 10, the, the 10 commandments. Right. And then after that, like in the, in the you know, uh, <clears throat> so, so in the gospel of, in the gospels he brought it down to just like uh like you know to like love god and then yes love other people but then also like james just, just said there's only one law he's like dude 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 just, just love you. yeah just love your wife man Come just, just love mm-hmm. just that's love, it just love your wife i, I like <laughs> it. it it all boils down to just love yeah mm-hmm. that's the that's the one law in this kingdom and so love is something that happens on the inside of a person. It's the heart. But anyways, okay, now we start preaching. Let me read the rest of this. So you can easily see how this definition had application to a New Testament apostle whose primary task was to travel with an apostolic team to establish the church in places where the church was non-existent. This is one historical usage of the word apostolos that has bearing on its meaning in the New Testament. A passport or travel document the word apostolos was so closely associated with the idea of traveling that it also eventually became synonymous with a passport or a travel document if a person wanted to exit a country he had to possess a travel document that was essentially an exit visa or a passport this legal document was called an apostolos an apostle the same word translated apostle the document guaranteed the right of passage and the ability to move freely from one place to another. When the word apostolos was applied to early New Testament apostles, it implied that an apostle was a spiritual passport that gave believers right of passage into heavenly realms and deeper spiritual truths. One can certainly see that those who were under the apost- the apostleship of Paul were taken into realms of revelation that they could have never attained on their own his ministry was a spiritual passport that gave them right of passage into spiritual revelation it should be noted that any person who operates in a genuine apostolic calling will lead people into new spiritual realities anyways i don't know about that part an ambassador or envoy the apostle also described a person who had the authority to act much the same way an ambassador represents his government to another government represents his government to another government this classical and secular meaning of the word apostolos meant an envoy sent to do business on behalf of the one who sent him thus a governmental apostle served as a personal representative emissary messenger agent diplomat ambassador or charge d'affaires this person officially possessed the clout and influence to speak and act in the place 
of the one who sent him on his assignment. So when the ambassador Apostolos spoke, his words were counted as the words of his sender. When the Apostolos acted, his actions were interpreted as those of his sender. The connection between the sender and the person who, who was sent was, al was almost inseparable. This reveals the New Testament apostles position to speak on behalf of the Lord. This is a governmental position within the body of Christ. And as such, an apostolic ministry gift should be received as one with great spiritual clout and with the backing of heaven. It is very important for you to understand this truth. And it's important that implicate. Okay, so great. So I think the guy kind of just started preaching towards the end of this one. But and it is interesting. I, I mean, what, what do you think about that? I mean, like the whole pa the passport thing because they traveled so much. That, that that was interesting. Because like he did, like you know, like uh, so Paul he 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 rode the boat. He went all the way to like Italy, Rome. He he went everywhere. Right. Know? So yeah, that's a big deal. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's crazy. Like that's you would think that that word came from the Bible. But like honestly, I think that uh, uh, Paul really became uh, like his his like fame. Uh, you know, of course, like God fame. You know, in him. But like obviously, like his fame really happened in prison when he was really like you know. Uh, really, you know, like, you know, restricted. And right. like, you know, it was in pr uh, a prison when his work, when, you know, when he was like really writing up some heat, you know, like some, some like good stuff, you know? Right. He, he was cooking up some heat, you know, like in, in the prison. So, cooking up some heat. Yeah. So pretty much, you know, so, you know, all of his work happened in prison because he was writing. And like, you know, so like with, with God, it's a, it's an interesting thing because like, you know, when you feel restricted, like what seems restricted or like negative or bad, or whatever, that's actually like the, 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 the area where you really start cooking up the heat, you know? Right. That yeah. is so deep. Miami heat again. <laughs> <laughs> Miami no, no. heat. <laughs> anyway, so it's, it's really cool. And, and then he got released. And then, of course, he travels again. And I'm just saying, like, it's interesting. Like, for example, like, you know, in, in COVID, in the COVID, you know, like, you and I started writing. Because, yeah. Because of the pandemic. So I'm telling you, like, it's it, there, there's, you know, there's something about being stuck in a jail cell. Like, maybe, maybe I'm have to, like, Commit a crime. I'm gonna go to jail. And I'll, 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 I'll come up with like the so best. So you can writing. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But that is so deep because I've never thought of it that way. Like, yeah, he could have been like boohoo crying in jail because yeah. he was like falsely accused and all this stuff. But instead, he's over here being like he's n he's still working. Yeah, and, and, and like you know, in his mind, he 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 probably thought, man, you, like you know, I'm I'm restricted. I, you know, I. I, I should be in Italy right now. I should be in, in you know Macedonia right now. I should be you know like he probably had thoughts like man like you know I should have been here 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 already. But but God is like no like you know this is where it's all gonna happen. Yeah. And like mm -hmm. even even David he was stuck in the cave for sixteen years and then and now you know his cry is turned into like what what help us every morning when we read the Bible you know yeah like uh the Psalms so it's 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 all because he was in like uh in in the cave you know that's. Again, he he was cooking us some some heat, you know. <laughs> right. So so I'm telling you, like like it all happens that way, you know. Man, well, one thing that intrigues me is like on the fact that you brought up him being in prison, him being an apostle, him being a minister, using this kingdom terminology. Actually, I'm going to read this part to you too as well. What a minister is, but if you put your hands on 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 one of the apostolos, if you put your hands on them, throw them in a prison, falsely accuse them, whatever it is that you do. You're not just like it said, he represents the person who sent who sent him and then also represent the government. Remember, if you put your hands on an apostle or a minister of the Lord, you're putting your hands on an entire country. And and I think that's that, that's why there's there is a protection program in God's kingdom <laughs> where yeah. it talks about when the arrow flieth by day or, mm -hmm. or by night, it shall not come nigh thee. Um, Oh, it's very intriguing to me. Right. Now check this out, John. The word minister. It's crazy. In a kingdom government, <laughs> <laughs> a minister is a high, a minister is a high ranking official who holds a position of authority and responsibility within the administration. Ministers are typically appointed by the monarch or head of state to oversee specific government departments or portfolios. 
They are responsible for formulating policies, implementing laws, managing resources, and representing the government in various capacities. Depending on the structure of the government, ministers may hold titles such as chancellor, secretary, or minister of state. And they often lead ministries or departments related to areas such as finance, defense, foreign affairs, education, health, or justice. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, like, you know, um, um, believe it or not, without without people, ministry is useless. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because, like, you know, ministry involves people, you know? Like, For you real? know... If, I, if you know when I become a pastor, like you know, I'm ministering to the people. You know, what I mean, I'm I'm like you know edifying them, I'm um, informing them, and then therefore they become transformed. You know, so really like you know, or or you know, I greet the door. I'm 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 a greeter again. Like people, people, people. It's it's all about people. You know, so really like without people, the uh, like <laughs> everything's useless. <laughs> For real. <laughs> Anything about that intrigued you? I could say what intrigues me about it. Um, it's. I just find it interesting because, again, that's a word that's used in the Bible that I never thought of. I thought it only, I never thought of it in terms of a, what it would be like in a kingdom. Because I didn't even, I mean, I guess I did hear some places, like maybe in a movie or something, where you have the minister, the prime minister. So I never thought about it as being a part of a kingdom. Yeah. I thought of it as always being a pastor. But it is a term that Paul uses. Um I don't remember who else. There's somebody else, I believe. But it is interesting. Yeah. Can you plug that white cord into the side right there? If you could reach that. Mm -hmm. So I want to say the part that intrigues me about it. The part that intrigues me, you got this. I believe in you. Stand up. Plug in. Nope. You gotta. I think you gotta press it in. There you go. There we go. All right. So, in the context of a kingdom, this is the part that intrigues me about the word minister. Because, and the reason I again why I bring all this up is because I think in America we we our application of these words are only within the four walls of a church but i like the meaning of this word where it talks about they lead ministries or departments related to areas such as finance defense foreign affairs education health or justice where i bring that part up to bring the point that Ministry can be beyond just being something within side of a church. Like you can serve your gift outside of a church as a minister of the Lord. And I think that's intriguing to me because I don't think a lot of people talk about that. And again, I think it is a very touchy topic because it, if you say that, it makes people think that you're trying to direct people away from church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But no, I bring this up because it's as if God wants to use people no matter where they're at, no matter what their gift is, what their talent is. It's not, it doesn't have to, not everybody's going to be a preacher. Not everybody's going to be on a pastor on a stage or a missionary. You might be a businessman full of the Holy Spirit. Oh, of course. Right. With wisdom of God. Like, but, yeah. Oh, it's true. Because, like, you know, like, you know, honestly, like the, you know, the Bible, the entire Bible is a melting pot of different people, criminals, businessmen. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, know. bro. He's in a melting pot of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? Criminals. Yeah. You know? I got Sinners you. keep on sinning. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and, and, yeah, got to put him there. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. I don't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> You remember the passage in the Bible where it says it says in the Old Testament that he will be called Wonderful Counselor? Yeah. Where, where did your mind think that that meant, <clears throat> Counselor? I mean, like you know, I have the Holy Spirit in mind because the Holy Spirit is really just really wise. Yeah. 
And I think that was 700 years before Jesus was uh, born, right? Was it like in Isaiah or something? I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Wonderful counselor. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, look at her. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> because as a kid, like you, especially at Christmas time, like that's one of the, one of the phrases used to describe Jesus Christ as wonderful counselor. But I was always like stuck at wonderful because there's like that one song with wonderful. His name was one, like they leave out the counselor part. Yeah, yeah. They just get stuck on the wonderful part. And so I never really thought anything about it until I was in maybe my late twenties. And then it's like, Oh, a counselor. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Like he, he helps us understand, but mm -hmm. yeah, I was my whole, most of my life I was stuck on wonderful. Yeah. I mean. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's that gospel music that people put, you know, like he's wonderful counselor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, or, yeah. or, or maybe it's like Chris Tomlin or something. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> I bring this point up because I asked some other people about this. I asked Anthony about it too. Yeah. Well, when people think of the word counselor, we again as Americans, we have our idea of what that is, what a counselor is. And we might think of like a therapist that you go to their place and you pay them and they counsel you and they console you. And you it, like, they're, they're helping you with through your emotions and stuff like that. And not saying that Jesus doesn't do that. Not saying that he can't do that by his spirit and stuff. But what I am saying is we got to look at, we got to get out of our American way of thinking and think in terms of kingdom. How does God think? How does Christ think? He's a king. What is, what is a counselor in his mind? It can be those things, but it's even greater than that. And I want to show you this. So in the context of a kingdom, which is all Christ preached about, in a kingdom government, a counselor is a trusted advisor who provides guidance, expertise, and support to the monarch or ruling authorities. Counselors play a crucial role in assisting the decision making, shaping policies and addressing various challenges facing the kingdom. They often have specialized knowledge in the areas such as law, diplomacy, economics, or military strategy. And they offer insights and recommendations to help the ruler govern effectively. Counselors may serve in various capacities within the royal court or government administration. Depending on the structure of the kingdom, they might hold titles such as chief counselor, royal advisor, or privy counselor. Their responsibilities can include analyzing information, mediating disputes. How do you say this word? Li liaising, liaising, liaising Li with other government officials. You got it? Is it leasing? No, it's not Lisa. Oh. <laughs> it's a li li I Hold on. Li Never mind. I we just got it. it. We and representing it. the monarch's interest in, di in diplomatic or political matters. Overall, counselors are essential figures in the governance of a kingdom, providing wisdom and expertise to assist the ruler in making informed decisions and navigating the complexities of ruling a realm. In a con... Oh, oh. So, any thoughts on that, guys? Uh, not yet, but that's okay. good stuff. So, I, I thought it was very intriguing. And and one of the things that it made me think of was when the Bible says that God gave man dominion over the earth. Mm -hmm. And that, that we are to rule over earth. That this is, this is, and it says that earth belongs to man. It says that earth is God's footstool and earth belongs to man. So, we're under God's feet. Yeah. Ruling earth. And him being a counselor, the rulers of the earth, he can advise the rulers with the laws. And, and, and obviously the Bible is full of the laws. And the number one law, love the Lord your God, with all your heart, soul, and might, love your neighbor as yourself. And there's, there's a lot of things that we deal with as people who God has put us here to manage on earth. And he is a wonderful counselor, not just an emotional support system, but someone who will help you in all the decision making right. of your life. And so, and I bring that point up because again, when it comes to like practical living things, such as 
business, finance, government. We often think God don't want nothing to do with that. Christ doesn't want anything to do with that. He's only here to just to get you saved and then he backs out and you just try to make sure you don't sin anymore until you die and go to heaven. Man, there's so much that God wants to do. We covered that in our first Bible study too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was good stuff. So realm. Now I, I just looked up the word realm because I, I oftentimes we use the word realm, the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what is a realm? And then I find this in a context in the kingdom context. <laughs> A realm refers to the territory or domain over which a monarch or ruling authority exercises sovereign control. It encompasses not only the physical land and geographical boundaries, but also the people, institutions, and resources within that territory that are subject to the authority of the monarch, the king. The term realm can convey a sense of sovereignty and legitimacy, emphasizing the ruler's authority over the entire domain. It is often used in a symbolic or ceremonial context to represent the unity and coherence of the kingdom under the monarch's rule. And uh, additionally, realm can also be used metaphorically to describe a sphere of influence or a domain of activity. Well, anyway, I'll stop there. Oh, and no, no, no. For example, one might speak of the realm of law, the realm of economics, or the realm of culture, referring to specific areas of governance or human endeavor within the broader context of a kingdom, of the kingdom. Overall, the concept of a realm is central to the understanding of kingdom governance, highlighting the extent of the ruler's authority and the scope of the responsibilities in governing the kingdom. Oh my gosh, man. I, I did wow. a lot of word study, man. That's good. Golly. You have been since high school. So like like that math connections class, remember that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have been. Like, you know, you took you so 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 you 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 know took the word uh kingdom and, and then there's like hyphen like between each you know, one of them and you're like mm -hmm. breaking it into you know, you know what I mean? Like breaking yeah. it into pieces. I wonder if and I then, still have it. And then like, you had brackets for for uh, you know after you well, between each hyphen you like had brackets and you're really studying everything. No, like, I do still have that piece like, of paper. You do? I have that paper somewhere. It was like it's in my journal. It was like K I like hi hyphen and then N, you know. Uh, you yeah, know, I like, broke down everything. the word kingdom. Yeah, yeah, and then you know those brackets. And King like, domain is crazy. His memory is on point. Looked like so 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 looked like it looked like the, it looked like, like the the fantasy football brackets, you know. Yeah, and that's what. It looked like. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh, I did more research on the word minister. The word minister has its origin origins in Latin. It derives from the Latin word minister. Oh, okay. Actually, I want to bring this point up. I was doing a, I was looking in the blue letter Bible. You know, the blue letter Bible? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Concordance and different things. And it's funny because there are some things on the blue letter Bible where it, it will literally tell you it, it does not know the origin of a certain word. Or it'll say, or or there's like commentary on the definition of words mm -hmm. where it's like wait wait why did who put commentary there on uh, certain words cuz it's like you don't need a commentary for that if that's the definition of it and that's the way that the bible used that word don't try to like substitute <laughs> it with cuz like when you read the bible and and in some bibles like i have a bible that has a commentary i'm very cautious when reading commentaries cuz obviously it's just another person mm -hmm. filling in there the way they think of it and perception or whatever they study mm -hmm. So I'm very careful, but even in studying the words used in the Greek language, when you're studying in a concordance, that sometimes there is a explanation and sometimes that, that explanation is off. So anyways, I had to dig on that word minister even further because there was a section on the blue letter Bible where it said, don't know the origin of the word. The, the word minister has its origins in Latin. It derives from the Latin word minister, which means servant or attendant. In ancient Rome, a minister referred to someone who served or attended to another person. Yeah, see? Oh, sorry. I, let me say something. Oh, yeah, so, like, remember what I just told you before? Like, uh, the minister involves people. Like, if there's no people, then you can't serve. Like, you, you, you can't, can't serve. Yeah, so, like, really, mm -hmm. it's involving yourself with people. That's really, like, the like the dummy definition of it. Yeah, the <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Referred to someone who served or attended to another person, often in subordinate or supportive role. 
over time, the word, the term evolved and took on various meaning in different contexts. In medieval Europe, minister came to be associated with religious officials who served in positions of authority within the church hierarchy, such as priests or clergy members. In the context of government, the term minister was adopted to describe officials who held positions of authority and responsibility within the administration. Well, Anyway, I got so many words. Covenant, scepter, colonization. That's good. I'll stop reading, though. Woo! <laughs> I think it's very important, though, to, like, really study what the Bible is saying oh, and yeah. not just gloss over information because I glossed over information for so long, but then once I started studying the definition of words and then looking at the historical meaning and trying to get to the source like what's the source behind the source behind the source yeah. mm -hmm. and then you start seeing like whoa the bible speaks of god's kingdom as if it's a literal real kingdom in a different dimension that's trying to colonize here on this planet oh for sure <laughs> yeah for sure like like it's really kingdom on earth and really like you know it's it's ministry like even in in the in, in the secular arena you know even people like uh so for example if i open a door for someone like if, I, if i'm going into a subway restaurant or something you know and i open a door for someone like uh, like old lady or something or someone in a wheelchair, you know that's ministry because I'm I'm serving that person or you yeah. know even marriage like marriage really what it is is, is you know um, serving one another and that's really what it is you know and that's you know that's a ministry because like you know you're serving within the confines of like the kingdom of God uh, in you know in between you and your wife in marriage. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I agree. I agree a hundred percent, man. And like you know, ministry could be like um, you know not non nonverbal too. Like it's it's by action or or verbal mm -hmm. if you wanted to or or just by the the lifestyle like like this like you know this like crockpot you know like lifestyle like where where like you know after a while someone finally realizes that that you're genuine, and then you know of course because you did it for for a good reason and that's like a you right know, so it's ministry you know mm -hmm. he said crockpot <laughs> or how do you, how do you say it with what's it called again the little machine where you, you put it and like, you heat up the food. Yeah, like the slow cooker crock pot. Yeah, crock pot guy. Yeah. I thought I said it wrong. I was like, I don't know. Hey, it sounded wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Yeah, it's a it's amazing, man. Yeah. So, but we brought up that point on love, where love the Lord of God, all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. This right here, I think it, it's a. It's also one of those topics where, first off, let me ask you guys this. What do you think of when people say the word righteous anger? What do you think about that? Oh, righteous anger? Like, it's mainly for, like, the right cause. Like, you know, it's it's not like, uh, you know, you're losing control. Like, you're 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 losing your control. But it's more to, like, uh, like to steer someone toward the right direction. You know, it's, it's more like wrath, you know? Versus like, you know, like a, like a rage. So it's, so, you know, so it's, it's, you know, instead of rage, it's wrath. So, so like, you know, rage is you're losing control. Like wrath is more like, you know, like, a, like, like a, you know, like a punishment or more like, you know, like, you know, I'm just showing you that I'm like you know, upset. Like getting a whooping? So, so thing, like yeah. the rage would be an emotional response, whereas yeah. the wrath is just a logical. Yeah, exactly. So, tough. yeah, exactly. So like, you know, the righteous anger is pretty much like you know like you know it's controlled and like it's you know it's it's for a specific uh reason or purpose it's not like uh you know like rage like rage is where you have no control you yeah know? And, and you know of course in in, in the book of uh, psalms like that's what it says not to do because because then they only lease the harm but like you know but but god's not trying to do harm he's trying to to like you know establish something you yeah know? And, and and he's disciplining his children that's the first time i ever heard someone use the word wrath in that context yeah, because like you know, wrath is more like this, like you know, righteous anger. Of, you know, of course, hell, like hell is wrath, and you know, that's a righteous anger because God is just in that, in that turn, in that uh, time. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah, that's you know, like hell is justice. You know, yeah, and you know, like that, that's why you should never ask God for justice. You know, <laughs> but I ask God for grace. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's why you should never ask God for justice. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting, man. I I never heard someone use the word uh, wrath in that context. Yeah, because obviously, I you see the word wrath, and there's a lot of negative connotation with that, or like when the Bible says have not to have wrath and stuff. But I think 
when you're you're when you're using the word wrath though you're not meaning it in the yeah it's, it's so so it's the context the right? rage yeah the yeah, context. yeah it's the context because like yeah it's exactly so like you know like you know you know again like you know jesus flipping tables like again yeah again so like you know there's the there's there's different parts in the bible where it says wrath is bad but like you know again you know just going back to that first question you know like you know knowing god like if, if you really know god like you know then you know his anger yeah so like you like, you know how to you know how to go about it the right way, yeah. not this humanized. And like that's how, you, and like you know, that's what you know if you really know that you know God. Just like, just going back to the question that we started off the podcast. Really, just go back. It goes back to that. Yeah, bro. Right on. Shoot. That is very. I like how you explain that. Yeah. I've never. I've tried. It's something I've tried to understand because I mean I just come at it from like anger is just an emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. So I could never understand how you could have. A righteous anger because how can you be righteous and then like angry punching holes in walls like yeah it, to me i couldn't figure it i couldn't make those like, work it's like it's like it contradicts like christ said not to even get angry with your brother and if you even get angry with him it's like murdering in your heart but then obviously it's like well there is times where you do need to take strong action but you don't do it out of hatred oh of course yeah right, so yeah exactly. so so yeah so so it's pretty much like you know you know righteous anger is pretty much like you know you know you have the right to be angry pretty much if you think about it like you know you you have the upper hand where it's like okay well, well you know this guy's right in in what you did and you have to apologize or whatever you know right exactly like and, just... and you know and of course you don't go off the like the wagon like oh i punched them because cuz cuz <laughs> you know cuz then cuz you know cuz cuz then you're not in the right anymore cuz you you violated like, but, but like, you know, if, if, if you have the right to be like, uh, angry and stuff like that, like, it's, it's not, it's not like, you know, like, a like, like a bad anger, but it's pretty much like, you know, you're like gently like telling them, Hey, like, that's what you did. And, and like, you know, they shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, bro. That's like the best explanation. How, how, how come, ever. how come I don't normally hear people explain it like that? <laughs> like, cause you, I mean, I'm not saying names, I'm not going to say names, <laughs> but you know certain people that i talk to where it's like when they say righteous anger that, that's why i don't even like to use the word righteous anger like because i think when you say that people's minds they think like oh yeah like i can get mad i have a right to be angry and it's like wait but that's the whole point of forgiveness of course and, and also you know like so so you know going back to sodom and gomorrah like you know god warned abraham like like 10 times Remember when Abraham was like, okay, so, you know, if there's 50 people in the city, can you, can you destroy it? And God's like, uh, like, wait, they say like, like, uh, like, oh, you know, there's no, there, there's no, uh, you know, 50 people there. And then, and then Abraham said, well, 40, you know, is, is there 40 people there? And, they, and then, you know, God kept saying no, but then like, you know, God kept like telling him, like, hey, you know, get Lot out of this place, you know, because, mm -hmm. because like, you know, because like, you know, I have I the right. Yeah, exactly. Because like you know, I have the right to be angry in the city because I because I, I warned them for so long that I yeah. have the right to destroy it, and that's the righteous anger, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because like you know, God communicated like way beforehand. Hey, like you know, I'm about to like you know send, send like uh, you know uh, brimstone and fire and everything like that. So yeah. God had that right. You know. Let me, let me ask you a question. How did you come to that realization? Like, how did you how did you? Because you said something very interesting. I haven't heard anyone else say this before. You were like, you said gently. Oh, gently, yeah. So, like, it's pretty much like, so, like, you know, so, so the Holy Spirit is like gentle, you know, but like, it's it's more like with love, because like, you know, how the Holy yeah. Spirit is gentle and he's uh, love and uh, kind, like how it says in the the Bible. So it's really like this righteous anger, but but with love, you know. So. <laughs> Dude, <Yeah>. bro, <laughs> bro, bro, bro. Because like, like for for example, like you know, if if you if you look at it, like your 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 like a dad, like like my my dad, you know. Like for example, he he punishes me, he whips me, and stuff like that. But like he did it out of love, like you know, he 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 he's doing it for the right reason, right, bro. You know, and that's the he you know. he wasn't disciplining you or spanking you or whatever because he was frustrated and angry at you, and he's just gonna like yeah, like you know he he it wasn't that it was like hey John, you messed up, you you did this, and I said don't do this exactly, and yeah. this is what's gonna happen now. Yeah, exactly, and like you know even yeah. earlier this year, like you know it was, it was hell on earth for me, like you know I was like there was some stuff that was going on in my life, mm -hmm. and then you know God was you know disciplining me, and then like he he was he was showing me like in in, in my mind he was telling me hey like you know so you know God get, uh, uh uh disciplines his children who whom he loves, and then you know it was hell on earth, but but God was kind of like boiling me because he, he doesn't want me to go off too far you know and mm -hmm. then and then he brought me back and then like uh, so it was a good thing you know so it, it was a righteous anger but to bring me back and it was love it, it was 
it was with a sense of direction you know bro that is amazing that is like yeah i'm telling you that's like the best explanation I've <laughs> like 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 but hold on it's like the best explanation without quoting the bible like i mean right, he, he, exactly. he he quoted uh he's talking about you know Sodom and Gomorrah and different things but he used the same words that's that's good dude that's good stuff right there bro mm -hmm. I mean, that explains Jesus flipping the tables. And that's what I'm trying to explain to people. Because when when Jesus flipped the tables, I used to be the person who was all for, like, it's okay to get angry. It's okay. Like, you need to show your emotions. Yeah, and get angry. You yeah. Get, like, you, when you get angry, then it's, like, a very emotional. Anger is an emotion. Mm -hmm. You can't just, you can't have, like, righteous anger. That's just, It's an emotion. God he, has emotions. He literally said you're it's it's your anger you're angry in a gentle way where it's like it's not this emotional out of control mm -hmm. it's like no like oh again i told you like it, it's it's like you know rage versus wrath it's two different exactly things, you know? so anyways there's so two passages i want to read and this right here actually no i'm not even gonna give this part away i'm gonna read this so i was praying one day and I was thinking about like how how do you how, to love people more right where i am constantly trying to practice patience all the time i want to love people i want to be kind to people i don't want to get angry with people lose patience get annoyed irrit irritated i don't want to do none of that and obviously it's very difficult because it's like okay i might not get i i, I almost I can't even remember the last time I was in rage. I can't even remember the last time I was in rage. Rage. Well, I don't know. Like, just think of like the last time you paid your bills. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> but like, um, but in general sense, but but getting irritated with people, getting annoyed with people, I have to I do. I practice so much. Well, patience. like honestly, like you know, if if you if you ask God to teach you patience, then like, He's gonna send someone to cut you off on the freeway. Hey, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I stop. I stop praying about that type of stuff. I'm like, I'm not gonna pray about it. Like, if I need to be patient, okay, just just be patient, right? Like, I don't want to have God have to step in and be like, okay, I'll do it for you. All right, bam. Let me put this irritating person in your path. <laughs> yeah. Because now I, 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 God, I didn't mean it like that. Just make me more patient. You don't gotta put me in a situation. But anyways, yeah. so I have practiced a lot of patience with people, and one of the things like I, i've practiced a lot of patience with people that are close friends of mine and like i'm the kind of guy who people can dis you could disagree with me and i don't care like it's fine if we disagree we disagree i'm like i'm okay with disagreeing mm -hmm. i'm okay you can disagree with me yeah john you could disagree with me even on air on this podcast and say, honestly, I don't well, agree like, with you about I can something. I agree on both of us disagreeing. <laughs> yeah. You could literally tell me like, oh, I don't agree with you about this or that or whatever. And then I just listen to you and be like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. But like one of the things that I've had to practice a lot of patience is in is when someone disagrees with me and then they're like, how do I put it? They're trying to like one up me oh yeah yeah <laughs> or prove that they're smarter or prove that they're or they're trying to prove me wrong just for the sake of proving me wrong or like you know i've I've had some very close friends who i don't even know if i call them close friends anymore i have i have no clue i mean i still love them but i just don't know how it is on their end but like they'll watch my podcast they study everything that i say right they they, they dig on everything every scripture i say anything i post they just they dig on it then they meet up in a group and then they talk about everything that i'm doing and saying and then they all come in a group and i get on a three-way call or two-way call whatever it is and then they all collectively start disagreeing me with me about a ton of things trying to prove me wrong trying to get me to change my opinion and i'm like guys look we we just disagree it's okay like we can yeah. still fellowship it's fine but they're like no the Bible says this and like, are you, are you even saved? And then like pressuring you to change your mind. And I'm like, holy cow. And so, but then these are your friends though. So I'm like, you know, I'm trying to continue just like, dude, we could just fellowship. It's okay. Yeah. Like that's the point of fellowship. We, we don't agree with each other. 
So we fellowship and we try to come to the truth together. Well, yeah. And like, you know, so like, you know, part of actually, you know, getting to know someone even more and progressing into knowing someone is, is, is disagreeing sometimes. Right. But that's part of knowing someone. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I ask it's you. It's not always agreeing. Like, you know, so like, you know, even in marriage, like, you know, you know, you have to ag constantly agree on disagreeing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, that's why I've asked you, like, like, I think I asked you last year. I asked you, I said, I said, John, what do you disagree with me about? And you, you told me a couple of things you disagree with me on. And I was like, that's good. Like, cause I don't want, I don't want people around me just agreeing with me about everything. Cause it's like, it don't feel real. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like if I say, I don't even know if I just say some outrageous thing and then you just agree with me and I test you, I'm like, I'm going to just say something out totally outrageous. And I'm going to see if you agree and be like, you know what I'm saying? And you, you agree. I, it's just fake. It's not real. Mm -hmm. And I like the ability to like me and Anthony, Anthony and I, we talk, we disagree on different things, but we're, we're going back and forth. And one thing that I think is really missing in the body of Christ is that ability to agree and disagree and still have dialogue, still love each other, still practice patience. Even if you get a little bit annoyed with the person in the, in the disagreement, still like you recognize, Oh, this person's kind of annoying me. But then afterwards be like, Hey dude, I'm sorry if I kind of came off wrong. You know, I didn't mean to, you know, I got a little bit passionate when we were just talking just now. Like, dude, just move on. Right. It, we need love in the... So I bring this point up because you you had brought mm -hmm. up the point about love. And now I want to read what, love, what the Bible describes love. Paul says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. This right here hits me so hard. The easily, not easily anger parts. It could also be um, annoyed. So love is not annoyed or love is not irritable. It doesn't get irritated. And um, a lot of times, they think about the degree of love that is where we often think that anger is just rage. But no, anger is also like, I'm just sitting here tapping my finger starting to annoy you a little bit that's that's easily angered you get you get angry with tiny things and it keeps no record of wrongs if someone wrongs you it doesn't hold it against you or you don't hold it against them ever or like jesus christ saying forgive 70 times seven you know do i forgive him seven times 70 times seven you just constantly keep forgiving them and so Christ is telling us to do this stuff. Paul's telling us love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. Now, I was praying and I was thinking about this passage. And I was just by myself and then I'm not going to explain the whole thing that happened. I told you this story. But. I was thinking about this and like, man, how, how, how do you get to a point where you don't even get annoyed or irritated? And as I'm sitting there praying, dude, this thing crossed my mind. It like, it was almost like a revelation just downloaded into my brain from heaven. Like it just uploaded and then pff, it hit me so hard that this standard of love right here, this is how God is towards us. I don't know why it hit me so hard. Like it does not hold any record of wrong. Right. Kind of like the woman who committed adultery. He's like, <clears throat> neither do I condemn you. Right. Yeah. Don't say no more. Exactly. Like that is what the number one law of this kingdom is, is love. And that's what it looks like. And then he says, they will know you by how you love each other. Let me ask you guys this. Do you guys, do you have that degree of love in your life? Uh, not always. <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm not perfect. I struggle. Mm, no, no. All right. I, I mean, I try, but I, I still mess up. <laughs> ask, my, ask my sisters. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you Great. Know, they'll, they'll, like my sisters will give you an honest opinion. <laughs> Especially the one that, um, especially the one that I live with, who I see every day, like the annoyance, like the small little things that bug me, like ask her. <laughs> I feel you, bro. I feel you. 
dude. Do you have perfect love? Man, I do. I got. I'm, I'm. I. I already told you. I'm always right. I have perfect love. He's perfect. I have been made perfect <laughs> in Christ. I, I am He. I have arrived. I am. I am reincarnate love. Honestly, no, nah, no. Nah. I think. Can I even say that I have love? I mean, I, I think I have love, but I think not that that degree. Well, like you know, not being like you know, like struggling a lot, and and like you know, not meeting the requirements, like uh, you know, allows you to be humble, and therefore, like that actually kind of helps you to keep progressing. Yeah. You no. Know? Yeah. For it's, yeah. Exactly. Humility is the one that actually like you know thrusts you forward. So it's that you know, um, um, sanctification, like the right. progress mm -hmm. that we're looking for, like you know. Cause like like you know no one's perfect but but we're always striving towards perfection and that's the sanctification like we're always like uh you know it's 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 the pursuit that's meaningful mm -hmm. dude that actually makes me think of something that i that i thought of as you were reading the passage um because it, people are going to hear that and then we were talking about how like it keeps no record of wrongs and I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. Good. But then you have people who are hearing that and they're going to say, so that's fine if I just do whatever I want. Because God's not going to keep any record of my wrongs anyways. Right? Oh. God keeps no records of wrongs. No, no, no. But like, you so, know, there's, there's other scriptures to back it up, of course. Like, you know, like that, um, that's why there's multiple scriptures in the Bible to like, you know, to like, you know, live on the Bible. So of course, the, the but like the Bible also says like, you know, how can... How can a righteous man uh, stay pure? It's by by living according to his word, you know. So mm -hmm. you you know you have to live according to the word, and of course there, there's so many verses that can contradict. But of course the context, you know, and 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 of course if you live, uh, you know, you know, um, to to know God, then that actually like so 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 pretty much it's this like you know you know again you know, just go back to know God again like the same question just go back to it like you know if, if you really know God then you then you wouldn't want to sin you know mm -hmm. that's just how it bro is. that is deep yeah yeah. Oh, yeah and that's why I keep bringing up that passage I, I love that passage it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance yeah like if you realize that this standard of love where it's telling you this is how you're supposed to love you're not even supposed to get angry with people you're not supposed to be self-seeking you're not supposed to envy people you're sp it is kind it's patient it's not easily angered it holds no record of wrong that's how you're supposed to be and it says that god is love so th this is what love is and then the god is this thing and then this is supposed to be how we're supposed to be it's like this whole it's a freaking it's a cycle it keeps repeating itself yeah and realizing that God is not holding your wrongs against you, it should be one of those things where it's like, wow. At the same time, he is, though, because, like, honestly, like, you know, so on Judgment Day, God's going to have our books, like, you know, in, in, in the Bible. So, so on the book, it shows everything that we did. So really, like, he does, but he doesn't. So, so that's well, why you have to be careful, you know. Well, like, I like, no, no, not you, but I'm talking about like, the people who are watching. You know? No, no, I see what you're saying. No, I know, I know what you're trying to say, but let, let, let me... Let me kind of clean that up real quick. You got a judgment seat for the sinner. You have a judgment seat for the saint. Yeah. So God's not going to hold. If you're if you're truly been born of God, He's not going to hold your sin against you anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 like you know, it's the great white throne for the sinners and the the, the judgment seat of Christ, which is for the righteous people. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. <laughs> the great white throne for this. You said for the sinner. Yeah. Like the, the great white shark. That's kind of scary stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i do not want to be there bro yeah. holy cow one of the goats <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so wow not holding your wrongs against you and then the other thing is when christ says if you do not forgive others of their trespasses god will not forgive you that is such an intriguing thought to me you know why because I mean, I can't. I don't. I don't. I'm not going to try to challenge you guys on this one. I'm just going to say whatever it is that I'm going to say. And then you can tell me your thoughts on it. Normally, I try to challenge people on this idea. Like, if if how do you get saved? Is it possible to be saved without God's forgiveness? And people, obviously, they're going to say, "Well, no, you have to have your sins forgiven to be saved." So then I say, in response. But if you don't forgive others, 
and it says that God will not forgive you of your trespasses. How can you be saved if you don't forgive others? And it's just like one of those questions where it's not a trick question. I'm not trying to trick people into stumbling over the words and stuff. It's to make you think because this is when I give these questions, these are things that I have thought about for my personal life where I'm like, well, it says that if you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you shall be saved. But then also it says over here, if you don't forgive others of their trespasses, God will not forgive you. That's true. No, like honestly, like, you know, so so pretty much like, like you know, how can you bail someone out of prison if they're locked up? So really, if, if you're like uh, struggling to forgive people, then you're in chains. So God can't save you if you're in chains. You have to free your chains first and then God frees you from that, you know? Yeah. Dude, it, um, I, I don't know how to describe this. I don't know how to word it. But I think oftentimes, like we don't we don't look at the Bible in full context. We look, we could just take out one passage and then make that passage be the gospel. Such as, if you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and believe God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. And you could just take that and then just forget about the entire rest of the Bible. And then, or you could do that on a different passage or like, there's so many ways to go about it, but it's like, because, and we often do that because if we look at everything in full context, it looks as though the Bible is contradicting itself when it talks about these things. But I'm saying the more I study, the more I realize, no, that it's not contradicting itself. I just don't understand it. If I think that it's contradicting, there's probably something that I am not understanding about it. And so with the whole idea of love and forgiveness it intrigues me because if we don't have love you might as well just give up this whole god thing yeah exactly because at the end of the day i mean yeah i could sit here and sound smart and talk about the kingdom i could sit here and prophesy i could sit here and have an awesome podcast and get a million subscribers and impact people's lives and make them feel good. Yeah, it's like First Corinthians thirteen, like what you're trying to say. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Let me read the rest. Let me read. Yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah. says he starts off the chapter with that. <laughs> yeah. No, right here he says, "Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but." when completeness comes oh yeah, well, let me go to the beginning yeah, it's, at Where, the start. It? it's at the start if i speak in the tongues of men and or of angels but do not have love i am only a resounding gong or a clanging symbol if i have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and if i have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love i am nothing if i give all of my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship that i may boast but do not have love i gain nothing i like this part i'm not going to say names but this part right here if i give all my uh, no, if i give my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship that i may boast the part that intrigues me about that is to me, it appears that there's a lot of Christians out there who do this type of stuff where they, they give away all their stuff or they like intentionally will put themselves in a situation where there's hardship and then they mm -hmm. boast about it. Like, oh, I did this. I gave away all my money. I, I was persecuted. But anyways, that's a side note. But do not have love. I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Man. This this love thing man it is such a big deal i'm gonna find that one passage where it says do not let the sun go down in your anger because i want to show you guys something that a lot of people do when i read this passage anyways any thoughts from you guys um so far no that's pretty good i don't have anything right now all right well Check this out. All 
All right, yeah, this is it right here. So on this whole anger thing and righteous anger and yada yada, I I think there's a lot of Christians out there who try to justify their rage and their anger and their annoyance with people because they'll be like, well, that person's evil, therefore I am mad at them or or some people hold bitterness in towards people where they'll oh, be like, oh, well, yeah. well, oh, this guy, he, he, he's done a lot of evil things. So I, I have a right to just be mad at him. And I bring this up because I always say that that's the whole point of forgiveness Yeah, is you, you forgive people because they made you mad. You only get angry at people because they did something that was evil or you perceive it as evil. You only get angry at people because they made you mad because they did something bad. Like, and so, cause people say, well, I, you ask people, do you get angry? They'll say, well, I don't get angry, but I do. I just have resentment. And well, I know, like, 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 you the, look up like the, the word resentment. Is, that's like, like, you know, resentment is more like uh like this, like anger that settles, like, that's like, it just like sits there. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Anger is more like, you know, action kind of thing, but settle, but like, uh, like the resentment is more like you're just sitting there angry at him you know <laughs> it's the same thing but just longer it's even worse it's like long term <laughs> this is a good topic man i didn't know that we we're gonna go on all this stuff i just wanted to see oh, what's and, and I also you know this scripture is a mindset thing too like it is yeah it is and i'll tell you why after you read it i'm gonna read it soon but go ahead what's the definition of resentment it is bitter indignation at having been treated unfairly unfairly <laughs> now i bring this up because that is the point of anger but isn't that kind look of look up the word bitterness too isn't that kind I'm about of a to read subjective this. like word though because it it you might think you were treated unfairly but whoever treated you that way may not be thinking that this was unfair treatment well it's like what john said it's a mindset like how you right. how you perceive something now look up the word bitterness because i'm going to read this and again, when I look into these, when I, you, you guys are seeing what I do in private for myself. So look up the word bitterness. All what right. is it? Um, anger and disappointment at being, being treated unfairly. Unfairly. So if you ask people a lot of, a lot of, uh, the Bible thumping type of Christians, not all Christians, just the Bible thumping type ones. The angry ones that preach, quote unquote, righteous anger. They all, they try to justify not the type of anger that John talks about. The, their, their human anger that I would say comes from Satan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. The flesh, ego. They try to justify it because they'll say, well, if this person, if they, you, they always say that. Well, if I'm treated unfairly, or if something unfair happens or unjust happens, I can have righteous anger towards that thing. And oftentimes they they try to compare themselves to Christ, where they'll say, "Well, they'll say, well, God, God gets angry, and He brings down wrath, so therefore I can get angry." Christ flipped the tables, therefore I can get angry. And I'm like, "Well, hold on a second, because there there is a version of anger out there that is good to have, but not the type you're talking about. Usually the people." I have to, it's in context because the people that I'm talking about, when, when you're talking to them, you can tell we both mean two separate things. You're talking about your the type of anger that you have where you get irritated with people. I'm talking about a, a type of anger that wants to stand for what's right, but it doesn't hold their wrong against them. It's like, no, okay, this guy still needs to go to prison, but you forgive him, right? Mm -hmm. Now, here we go. I oh, mean, John made me lose my place. Hold on. <laughs> All right. So it says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. All right. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Pause. All right. This is what most, I'm not going to say most Christians. This is what most Bible thumpers do. They stop at that passage and then they say, see, 
it says in your anger do not sin or it says be angry and, and, and don't sin in your anger right and <clears throat> be angry and sin not so they stop there and it's like no you, you're not understanding if you just stop there it sounds like it's telling you to be angry just don't sin it's like no do not let the sun go down on your anger while you are still angry all right great so then they try to justify this part by saying see you can be angry just don't let the sun go down on your anger see and i get it i know i know i used to think that way until i actually didn't just skim over this passage one day i was like you know what what does this actually mean so i read it and then i was like when i actually focused on the passage and i was like really reading it, i was like wait a second that's not telling you to be angry until the sun goes down it's telling it let me word it like this it's saying if you're angry get rid of your anger as fast as you can don't even let the sun go down on your anger don't even go to bed exactly. until the anger is gone that's what it's saying it's not just it's not giving you a license to be angry until the sun goes down right. it's telling you to get rid of it don't even go to bed that's how bad anger is and then it says and do not give the devil a footstool or a foothold anyone who has been stealing must no longer steal but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building up building others up according to their needs according to their needs i like that part but okay that it may benefit those who listen and do not grieve the holy spirit of god with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption get rid of all bitterness all rage uh, all bitterness rage and anger brawling and slander along with every form of malice be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other just as christ just as in Christ, God forgave you. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. This is so deep to me that we just read over that like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't get angry. All right, cool, cool, cool. We just gloss up. No, no, no. Slow down. Get rid of all bitterness. You just read that part on bitterness. Mm -hmm. That is, you're angry because you were treated unfairly. Mm -hmm. That's what bitterness is. And then when someone says, well, I don't get angry, I just have resentment. That word resentment, it says the definition of it, bitterness. Exactly. <laughs> it's just another way to soften up the word anger. Just like, I'm not, never mind, I'm not going to say that. Um, we like to substitute words to make ourselves feel better about being wrong, I think. Oh, yeah, I was going to say something too about this. So pretty much like, yeah. like. Like how I mentioned, it's like a mindset thing. So really, I was like, you know, I was imagining like a husband and a wife, like they're they're going to bed, you know, and then like you know the husband is sleeping, the wife is sleeping, and then like you know the husband like while you know like normally when people sleep, they they actually like you know like they recap and they rethink everything that happened throughout the day, you know, like, right. you, know you know like you know how sometimes we do that where we just like you know like think about how how the day was, whatever. Well, right, you know that gives the devil like a little playground to work with, you know, because really like you know then you start to like you know justify your your side and what happened and then and then and the wife is like you know like thinking about like you know what happened in, in in her day and her side and really just like you know like that's why like you know when you go to bed it could be dangerous especially if, if you haven't resolved it so if there's an argument or something that happened you have to resolve it right away mm. because like you know uh you know in the bible you know it, you know it mentions vain imaginations so so pretty much like you know like it talks about pretty much like how like you know these these thoughts that come in are not actually your thoughts and that's why jesus says, jesus says to take captive of those thoughts you know because like they're not all your thoughts so really like you know what happened can actually like you know whether it's true or false or whatever like the devil can come in with his thoughts and then mix it up and now you have like a like a like a like a you know disgusting smoothie going on <laughs> <laughs> bro yeah so that was deep. that yeah that was deep bro that was deep <laughs> yeah yeah because he's saying you know like 
you go to bed and you're just constantly thinking about it. You got that resentment. Oh, you got for that sure. bitterness. Yeah. You just, you're laying there in bed. You're thinking about the conversation and like, that you and had. And like, that's the dangerous part. Like, you know, you're alone in your mind. Dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? Exactly. <laughs> you know? Take captive yeah. every thought. I, br- <laughs> Golly, man. He's, <laughs> he's doing it, bro. Like, he, he, <laughs> goodness, man. Goodness, goodness. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that, man. Because... Like I've seen you upset before, just oh, a little wait, bit. You have where? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, well. Just, I, like I told you before, like with the book thing. Oh, where? Like when? Like um, with, with we're on the phone and you're talking about the book and Barnes and Nobles and stuff and like yeah. they're not. They, uh, you were upset on the phone. Like you were like you were really mad. Oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you were like passionate too. You were like man, uh, but but like you, you know I. I Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If you don't want me to say that, I don't got to say that. Well, no, it's okay. But I, like, okay, okay. but like the thing is, like you know, I, you know, I was trying to like, you know, it was for my first book signing. Like you know, I got rejected so many times for my first book signing. Like you know, and then like now, but like now I'm on tour now. But like before, it was like, dude, like, like you know, they thought I was a nobody. I was like, dude, like, come on, please. Like, and then and then now yeah. like and like now they're scheduling me. Like, well, that's crazy. Wow. <laughs> awesome. Dang, man. Yeah, but I was mad. I was like, oh man. <laughs> no, nah, yeah, yeah, I feel you, bro. No, I, I mean, I got that type of stuff at my job, man, where you got people at my job. I'm doing bodyguard work and I can get uh, how do I explain this. Whenever I go to my job, I'm in a heightened state of awareness. Yeah. So anything can irritate me because my job's dangerous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, there's one guy at my job who he'll hop around the corner and try to scare me. He's a manager. He'll try to like hop around the corner and scare me. And bro, I don't even know how to describe it to you. <laughs> it is so like there, there's so many things where your mind will go like, I can't believe that guy just tried to jump scare me just now. Yeah. And like, and I I literally warned that guy. I'm like, hey man, be careful, dude. I'm like, stop stop messing around, man. He's a manager. I'm like, dude, I don't care if you're the manager, bro. You better be careful. I'm like, I'm out here armed up and stuff. <laughs> And I, you think you're going to hop around a corner and I've already been in crazy situations. And anyway, so I like, I have to practice patience with people on my, my job and, you know, got people on my job. They all, people got their heads puffed up and everybody's trying to, it's a bunch of men there. Everybody thinks they smart. And so, yeah, I got to practice that even more, not getting irritated with people, man. Oh snap! It's already two hours. What the heck? Oh wow! <laughs> Shoot. Well, some good conversations. That's why. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Shoot. Anyways, y'all, that was a good podcast. I think. Uh, oh, it was good. It was really good. It was good. It was yeah. deep. Yeah. Talking about love. Talking about the kingdom. Talking about forgiveness. Forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Talking about like know- knowing God. Knowing God. <laughs> trying to think of a passage then christ say if you love me keep my commandments mm-hmm. and his commandments were they will know love. you by your fruits they will know you by how you love each other maybe we should do like another podcast of like uh you know like like you know uh on on the, on the judgment day how like you know god says like you know I, I i never knew you then be like well how come you know how come god didn't know me if you create if he created you you know <laughs> shoot well, anyways, y'all, look, if you enjoyed this podcast, you enjoyed this emergency Bible study. I didn't really have a lot of notes this time. I kind of just just winged it this time. It was spontaneous. It was it spontaneous. Was nice. Go with the flow. See where the conversation leads. I legitimately did not know that this Bible study was going to be mostly talking about love and forgiveness. I did not think that. It's better that way. Like, you know, when it's spontaneous, like, it's better that way. For real. It's natural. Yeah. So, if you like that conversation, hit the like button, subscribe, do all those YouTube things. Always subscribe. Even if you're a hater, subscribe. I'd rather you you be hating on me than someone else. Because at least I'm going to practice being patient with you. (laughs) And love on you, and try to point you in the right direction. And speaking of love, like you know, we 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 really love the Miami the Miami Heat. You know, <laughs> for real. <laughs> Shout out, was gonna. <laughs> All right, y'all, man. Give us your input. Give us your insight. Comment below. 
Maybe I'll get a Patreon soon or something. Boost the algorithm. Help out. That's the best thing you can do. If you're trying to help out, maybe I'll make a donation thing at some point. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good mm-hmm. idea. Oh, when I do live videos, I can do the whole. Eventually, we'll go live and you guys can. And like, you know, start sending money. Yeah. And then like, you know, if you want, you can also like, you know, support like like a sponsorship for like a, for like a cause, like uh, homeless shelters, whatever. Like, hey, like we're doing this for the homeless. But it's for a good cause. Oh, like to kind of boost it up. And then, and then like that way, like, you know, you know, you can also some like some people will be like, oh, yeah. And this is also for you personally, whatever, you know. Whatever you so do. the sponsor for this video today is John Matei. <laughs> so you can get his book called Brave for Freedom by John Matei. You got to get his book. It's a, it, I'm not kidding right now. This is actually a book that he wrote. Yeah. Bur- so it's Brave, B-R-A-V-E, Brave for, F-O-R. Brave for Freedom. I'll probably put a link in the description. It's everywhere. Barnes & Noble's, Google, Amazon. Right. Yeah, yeah. All Ma- that good stuff. Mars, Pluto. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, y'all. God bless. And see you next time. See you next time.